Hello and welcome. Thanks for tuning into my presentation. Today we're going to learn about dust grain evolution from submicro grains to pebbles to planets. So why should you care about dust grains? Well, the first point is obvious that what I will call dust is actually the planet forming material. So everything uh, that we see around us every day. Secondly, if you care about chemistry, uh, then dust provides surface area for complex chemical reactions. And as we'll see later, dust is also moving, so it's also a means of transporting the composition of the disk and thereby uh, globally changing uh, abundances. Furthermore, dust is the major source of opacity, so it affects also the temperature and density structure and the ionization in the disk. So it's also important for a coupling to magnetic fields and again for chemistry. And last but not, not least, um, being the dominant opacity, it is actually also what we most ready, readily observe as continuum, um, dust continuum thermal emission. So it determines the observations. Um, and as we'll see later, it's also an important probe for the dynamical processes at play. So in this talk, I want to talk about first the dynamics of dust grains, then how grains change their size. And then we we'll put this together to combine dynamics and growth and see what this means uh, for how you form planetesimals, the building blocks of planets. This one, this talk is not really complete without also checking um, if what I told you about the theory um, has some meaning in reality. So um, there's a follow-up part of this talk given by Miriam Benesti. And um, also strongly uh, linked to my talk is the talk by Jehan Bay about structure formation. Throughout my talk, I want to use these two kind of boxes. Uh, the green ones um, I will mostly not mention. Um, it's background information or um, in-depth information for people that want to learn more. And the blue boxes are giving you either summaries or maybe some um, simple estimates of uh, processes that we'll, talk, we'll be talking about. Okay, let's dive into dust physics. Um, the first part on dynamics. What I want you to take away from this is the following nice movie that I got from YouTube. Here you see dust evolution at play. So you see how the dust grains um, in the disk are carried up by turbulence. They are also fragmenting by turbulence. Sometimes they collide, form larger bodies and sediment down to the mid plane. Um, and there's a couple of important takeaway points to be made here. The first one is dust and gas are obviously coupled, uh, but they're not doing exactly the same. So for example, uh, there is gas everywhere, but not dust everywhere, right? So by seeing uh, what the dust is doing, you get an immediately, you get an, uh, some information about what's going on, uh, just already on, based on your intuition. Um, but you know that there's gas every, everywhere and you shouldn't make a one-to-one -one um, translation between dust and gas. So what it really boils down to is that solids and gas evolve differently, but not independently. And we want to understand how this works. All of this relies on drag forces. And um, we'll focus only on one drag force regime, the Epstein regime, which is most relevant for um, the particle sizes that we are talking about. So here's a formula. You see the drag force depends on the gas density, the denser the gas, the stronger the drag. It depends on the cross section, um, the area of the dust particle, the thermal velocity um, of the particles, uh, of, the, of the gas, and the relative velocity between the gas and the dust. If the dust moves at the same speed as the gas, obviously there's no drag and this term vanishes. So um, based on this drag force, we can also estimate a time scale associated with this process. So think about a dust grain that is being um, sitting in some gas. The gas is moving and it will accelerate or decelerate the dust grain depending um, on the relative velocity. So we divide the momentum by this force that gives us a time scale. And um, you see that it's inversely proportional to the gas density and linearly proportional on the particle size. If we plug in some um, disk values, then typically, at, at least at 1 AU, we get something like seconds for micrometer-sized grains, so it is immediately coupled, basically. 
uh, while a meter sized particle would take of the, um, a good fraction of a year uh, to adapt to the gas speed. Something that's more useful than these absolute values um, is the Stokes number. What it, why is it useful? Well, um, you see that all of this depends on temperature, on densities, and on grain properties. Uh, so the Stokes number is really a dimensionless way of saying um, particle size. It's giving you basically the aerodynamic size. If you know the Stokes number, you know how it aerodynamically uh, behaves. And so we construct a dimensional size in the disk by multiplying the stopping time uh, with basically the, the dividing it by the orbital time scale, basically. Um, and this is what it boils down to. We see the same trend. It's linearly proportional to the particle size and inversely to the gas density. Here, I already used mid-plane conditions, which is where most of the dust um, is living. So what does it really tell you? Well, if the Stokes number is very small, it means that particles couple to the gas very quickly, faster than one orbit. Now, given these drag forces, we can derive um, an important ingredient that is radial drift. How does it work? Well, we start with a dust particle without a gas around. And then, as you know, you can um, balance gravitational force with the centrifugal force of a circular orbit. And if those are meant to be in balance, uh, you can solve this and you derive the Keplerian velocity. For the gas, this is slightly different because it also feels pressure gradients that uh, cause accelerations. And if, you, if we include the um, acceleration by pressure gradients, and we still want a, um, a force balance, basically, um, and since the disk is hotter and denser on the inside, we have to reduce the centrifugal force and have therefore reduce the orbital velocity. So the gas is actually, in most parts of the disk, slightly subcaplarian. If we calculate this value, put in some, um, some uh, typical quantities, we find that it's only like a per mil or 0.1% slower than Kepler. So this doesn't seem important, but it's really important for the dust grains because even 0.1% of the Kepler velocity is still a large velocity, something um, like 60 meters per second. And so if a dust particle tries to orbit at Keplerian speed, it would have headwind of 60 meters per second. And you can imagine that these drag forces are important. One result of this is that these particles that start to decouple, uh, they lose angular momentum to the gas and they drift inwards. And based on what I've shown you here, uh, you can see that this depends on the pressure gradient. So what we can boil it down to is that large grains, um, I will sometimes call them pebbles, um, you can also define it as having a Stokes number larger than the turbulence parameter alpha, they tend to drift to higher pressure. And the drift speed is proportional um, to this time scale and uh, the stopping time therefore also proportional to the Stokes number or proportional to the particle size. That means larger particles have a higher inward velocity. You see that it doesn't hold everywhere, but it holds for those regions that we care about. But if we go to very small particles, Stokes number smaller than alpha, they just follow the gas velocity, which is the dashed line in this case. And what I wrote here that the drift towards higher pressure that works in all three dimensions, as it turns out, also vertically, so particles uh, settle to the midplane. Um, how can we understand that? Well, if we start with an inclined orbit um, tilted away from an imaginary midplane, then the particle is actually, if you imagine co-orbiting um, with it, the particle is actually moving from above the midplane to below the midplane to above and so on. But if we now have a gas disk around this midplane, the particle tries to move through this gas constantly. It will, it will feel a um, drag force. It will again feel a deceleration. And this deceleration wants to cancel out this vertical motion, making it sediment to the midplane. So the takeaway point here is again, large particle sediment, large particles also drift. And the settling time scale we can write as one over the Stokes number times the coherent frequency. So if we had only this, then all the particles would move to the midplane. Uh, but this actually turns out not to um, be right. Particles seem to be distributed vertically. And that means we need some form of turbulence that is balancing this sedimentation. Otherwise, 
uh, discs would look like Saturn's rings. So here you see one ex exemplary movie um, of the vertical shear instability and hydrodynamic instability that causes some form of turbulence. And uh, while the movie starts with all density in the center, you see how uh, quickly um, this tracer is mixed by the turbulence. And the same happens to dust particles. And again, we can derive a, a time scale for this process. In this case, we would call it the diffusion time scale. Diffusion time scales are always something like a length scale squared divided by the diffusion coefficient. And so for typical disk assumptions, we can boil this again down to something very simple. And it's one over turbulence parameter times uh, the Kepler frequency. So we've seen that this all works now in vertical direction and in radial direction. And it actually also works in azimuthal direction. Um, so you will probably see more about this in Jehan's talk. But our conclusion of all of this um, is basically the following. If we start with particles um, distributed like this, uh, then the large particles sediment to the midplane and the small particles uh, would be mixed efficiently. And on top of this, uh, we have learned particles and the large particles drift towards higher pressure. Uh, that means in a normal disk without substructure, they would uh, drift inward um, and larger particles drift faster. And I said a normal disk. So if we have some perturbation in the pressure structure that causes a local maximum in the pressure, then you can already guess what's happening. Uh, particles in here, if they drift up the pressure gradient, they just keep moving inward. But those particles here, they also drift inward and eventually stay at the highest point here. And maybe also the ones that are uh, starting just inside of this, they will also go up the gradient and end up here. So a pressure maximum um, is something that we would call a dust trap uh, because it can locally trap the dust particles and stop them from drifting inward. So that's a summary for um, the dynamics of the dust. And now we also need to think a little bit about how dust particles grow. For this, we have to rely on laboratory studies. Here are some examples from the group, um, the group in Braunschweig uh, by Jürgen Blum. On the top left, you see two particles hitting and sticking, small particles. If you go to different aspect ratios, we can have also effects where the small one is um, fragmenting, but it's depositing some mass on the bigger ones. Particles can also collide and just bounce off each other, depending on their velocities and uh, their inner makeup. And for high velocities, um, the outcome will not so beneficial to, to, will be not so beneficial to growth and instead to lead to fragmentation. And the important point to realize now is that these two effects are coupled, uh, because if we change the environment of the particle by dust transport, um, then we also change, um, for example, the collision speeds that the particles experience. And if the particles uh, grow, they actually change the aerodynamics, which again affects the dust transfer. So the dust transport has some effects, like driving collision speeds and sorting sizes, that affect the evolution of the inner makeup of the particles and their size evolution. And um, all of these three parts are strongly interlinked with each other. So we can't really decouple these processes. But despite all of these complications, we can boil down all these complicated collisional growth effects into a very simple time scale again. That is basically the growth time scale, or you could also call it the size doubling time scale, or it's almost the same as the collisional time scale. And it works surprisingly well, um, but of course, it doesn't work everywhere. If you want to learn more about it, you can uh, look up the derivation here. And it looks similar to all the other time scales. It's um, proportional to the orbital time scale. And in this case, we divide by the dust to gas ratio epsilon. But we have to put all of this together now uh, to understand it. So let's combine what we've learned about dust growth and dynamics. Here are two simulations. The left one is evolving a gas disk. You see here the dust surface density and the gas surface density as function of distance to the star. And in the left simulation, the particle size was just fixed. And in the right side, the particle size is evolving according to these um, collisional evolution models. 
and you see that the outcome is completely different. In, on the left side, um, you see that you get a different uh, power law, a different time scale, you get a sharper outer edge. So if we want to understand how these uh, disks evolve and how our observations of them change with time, we really have to combine these effects. And here we are now combining our knowledge so far um, in a simple toy model, let's call it like this. So we have here distance to the star on the x-axis and particle size on the y-axis. And let's imagine starting three particles over here. And then you see that the gross time scale um, is proportional to orbital time scale. So particles in the inner disk, they grow faster. And small particles don't really drift, they are well covered to the gas, gas, but as they become larger, they will start to feel this radial drift force and their trajectories will turn inward. And it turns out we can construct something like an almost embedding curve, this red line of all these trajectories, um, which we call the drift limit. So particles seem to not grow over this limit because instead of uh, growing in place, they are actually drifting inside and they're drifting as fast as they're growing. But this is still the best case scenario. As it turns out, the larger the particle, the larger it drifts and therefore also its collision speeds tend to scale with the size. And so these largest particles, they might collide at speeds at which they don't grow anymore like after the collision, but instead fragment. So this is what I indicated here. And we usually call these therefore the drift limit and the fragmentation limit. So these particles in here, they um, would have been too large. They have to collisionally be ground down to smaller sizes. And therefore we would also expect lots of small grains um, in this part where the fragmentation barrier dominates. And turbulent mixing will also distribute this somewhat into the outer disk while throughout the outer disk, most of these parts are expected, um, or we expect the particles to mostly follow this maximum size as they are drifting inward. So this is our toy picture. Let's compare this to an actual simulation. This uh, is the same plot, and in color, in color, you see the distribution of the dust mass in the disk. So if I start this and stop it immediately, you see how dust grows is ha um, happening very quickly in the inner disk. And the outer disk is just um, lagging behind because of the longer dynamical time scales. You see also that not, nothing much seems to be changing in here. Uh, that is because particles continuously grow up to maximum size and then they fragment. And this leads to an equilibrium between growth and fragmentation, which is a steady state uh, particle size distribution. But particles are still drifting inward. In the outer disk, however, you will see that particles are limited by this drift barrier that we plotted here as purple line. And that's a typical outcome. And you see also how the uh, drift barrier is evolving. If I go a little bit back, you see it's moving down with time and larger parts of the disk become drift limited. So these are just the particles that grow and uh, they grow while they drift and they basically follow this curve up to the part where fragmentation becomes more important and then fragment the fragmentation barrier becomes the limit. Okay, what does this now mean for um, the first step to forming planets, which is creating the building blocks of planets, the planetesimals? Well, in the simulations, we have seen only particles of um, about 10 centimeters or so are formed. All particles otherwise drift towards the star. Uh, no planetesimals, um, meaning kilometer sized bodies or larger, are formed, and there shouldn't be any planets. So that seems like a problem. And there's two different pathways to solve this problem. One would be saying um, there is some collisional way where the particles can still grow um, by gradually growing by collisions. There has been some work on this. I'll leave some of the references here. But overall, this doesn't seem very efficient um, or in some cases doesn't really match the observations. Uh, so I'll skip these and instead focus on uh, the hotter topic, which is gravid turbulent planetesimal formation, or people sometimes also call it uh, planetesimal formation via the streaming instability. What it looks like is the following. Uh, so in this simulation um, by Johannes et al, 2007, we see the dust over density in color. And um, what is simulated here is a mixture of dust and gas, 
Um, and this mixture on very small length scales, you see this is a fraction of a pressure scale height. Uh, this dust and gas mixture can become unstable to the streaming instability. It forms um, these, these streams, so to say, um, in, around the midplane. And um, it can form some relatively dense regions. And these dense regions can become so dense uh, that they are gravitationally bound um, and should be collapsing down to um, size of comets or asteroids. Here's a more recent uh, result looking at this at a much higher resolution. And you see uh, you get a whole uh, wide range of bodies that are formed in here. And you can look at the statistical properties of all the formed objects. Um, but there's one important crucial ingredient uh, you need to remember when you want to do this. Um, we have two criteria that we need to fill. First of all, we need to have large enough particles. Uh, typically, this is in the order of a Stokes number of 0.01 or so. Uh, but this is still um, subject to uh, current research. And on top of this, uh, our initial dust to gas ratio, which is usually 1%, is not enough to get this triggered. We need already to enhance this locally to maybe something like 3%. And the data is on the side of, this, uh, of these models. Um, what is plotted here is uh, the orbital alignment of binary objects in the Kuiper belt, so trans-Neptunian objects. Um, so there's a relatively large fraction of binary TNOs. And their orbits seem to be preferring a prograde um, binary orbits, not retrograde ones. Random alignment would be this curve. And the observed curve is um, this dashed line here. And the simulation outcome of the simulation that I was just showing you, this one here, uh, that indicates a, a relatively good match between the simulation um, alignment of binaries and the Kuiper belt. And also the, the one Kuiper belt object, Arrokov, that was recently pictured by the New Horizons mission, that also indicates that it seems to be a binary. And we've seen the same in the uh, Rosetta mission uh, for the Comet Turing. So all of this basically points towards the idea that um, we do not grow particles uh, to planetesimal size. We have to grow them a bit, and then um, gravel turbulent planetesimal formation can take over. But not all is good in uh, this field of planetesimal formation. There are some uh, crucial questions recently. One is what happens if there's also external turbulence? Can it prevent all of these overdensities to form? Um, and it's also not clear what happens if you do these simulations in a bit more detail, where not all particles have the same size. And there are some ideas that this might actually make this process much less um, efficient. Based on these dust evolution models on the one hand and the planetesimal formation models on the other hand, something like a new paradigm um, has developed, I think. Um, so it has turned out that growing planetesimals by making them stick together is um, very hard or impossible. But equally impossible is it to collapse small dust particles. Um, they are just well coupled, so you can't really concentrate them. But on the other hand, uh, growing to the pebble size, uh, so to uh, Stokes numbers of 10 to minus 2, is pretty, pretty easy, it seems. Um, it's a typical outcome of most of these collisional evolution models. And collapsing particles of that size seems to be also easy if you slightly accumulate them. So um, the, this new paradigm is basically that you take dust evolution that makes large enough particles, uh, pebbles, and then you take uh, some of your favorite uh, instabilities or mechanisms that cause any kind of substructure to slightly enhance the local density of dust. Uh, what that really is is still uh, um, a matter of debate. Uh, but if, if you put these two ingredients together, uh, then you have the right conditions for planetesimals. So the big question is really what is uh, behind uh, these, uh, these traps? How do you make a pressure bump, for example, that can trap particles and accumulate them and make planetesimals? Um, most of this, I would refer you to the talk by Jehan Bay, 
um, who will talk about um, basically the structure formation in disks. I want to just briefly mention uh, one thing which is probably not um, often discussed in this context, and that is what's happening near the snow line, uh, because uh, snow lines are also a relatively hot topic. The summary is that snow lines are very complicated, um, and I want to show you one reason why they might be interesting, uh, but there is a whole bunch of other different complications going on. But at least one idea is the following. You have the dust particles um, that are also partially icy drifting inward. And as they drift inward, the temperature in the disk um, is increasing. And if the particles cross the water snow line, the water will sublimate and you will have your bare grains left. Well, it's not quite clear um, how this process happens um, if already the um, sublimation destroys the grains, but even um, if the grains remain contact and they just lose the water, um, it is thought that the water really makes them more stable and more sticky. So if you remove the water, they break up much more easily. Um, and that means they would locally um, be ground down to smaller size by fragmenting collisions. But if they are now smaller, they would also drift less fast. And if you continue this process, you continually bring um, dust particles with a high rate in, and then they, they locally decelerate. So what you have is really a traffic jam, and you will locally enhance the amount of small dust. So this often um, termed the um, traffic jam effect. Um, and it has a bunch of different um, possible outcomes that are still discussed. So I want to point you to several follow-up works where this plays a crucial role. Um, but I should also mention, uh, you see that all of this depends very strongly on the microphysics. Um, and this is still something that is uh, very much debated as you will see in these papers. So it's really not clear if particles inside uh, do fragment uh, much easier. So the takeaway point here is that snow lines are very complicated. We talked only about this one effect. There's still a lot of other effects, for example, also changes in the opacities, um, maybe recondensation of the grains uh, and collective drift effect. Um, so if you want to learn, learn more about it, I would encourage you to look at uh, these papers and references with it. So this brings me to the summary of this talk. Um, I hope you could take away the following points. Dust particles grow, and they grow faster in the inner disk, slower in the outer disk. They also grow faster if the dust to gas ratio is high. And they grow only until a certain limit, usually either if they don't stick, uh, but if that bounds or fragment, um, or because drift is removing them faster, and then they can grow. And crucially, all of this depends on the microphysics. And I find it quite fascinating how some of these microscopic processes can fundamentally change the outcome um, of how disks evolve or how planets form within them. The other point to take away on the transport side is um, dust particles drift faster if they are larger. Um, and all of the particles, large and small, are diffused by turbulence. So it's usually some form of a competition between drift motion to the midplane radially inward and maybe in asymmetries also asymmetrically against turbulent diffusion. And if you have um, Stokes numbers or particle sizes and dust to gas ratios large enough, for example, in a pressure tra trap, uh, then uh, we think you have the right conditions to form planetesimals. But now that I have told you all of this, it's time uh, to do a bit of a reality check and I would hand it over um, to Miriam Benesti for the observational part. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Till. So in the second part of the talk, we're going to confront the theory of dust evolution to observations. And we will try to address all the points that Till explained in his talk, but from an observational point of view. So we'll first start by explaining how we can observe dust grains of different sizes. And then I will briefly discuss a very small selection of observational results that allow us to investigate whether or not dust grains can grow, whether dust grains are trapped in regions of high pressure, and whether the dynamics of dust, the dust motions, is different for different dust sizes due to the fact that they are evolving in a gaseous environment.
So we know that we must grow grains because we observe planets. And we start from some micron size dust grains that are in the interstellar medium. And this, these grains grow to millimeter, centimeter, planetesimal sizes, up to kilometer sized bodies. But as observers, we are facing a problem that is that our current instrumentation does not allow us to observe beyond the centimeter wavelengths regime. And that means that we are mostly sensitive to sizes of grains that are from micron size to centimeter sizes. And the wavelengths at which you will observe these grains is, at which you will observe your disk will determine the typical sizes of the grains that you can observe. And why is that? It's because we see these grains thanks to their opacities. And I show here a plot of the dust opacities calculated for population of dust grains of different sizes with a certain dust size distribution. And by setting the maximum size of the dust grains in each population, going from one micron to one centimeter. And these opacities are shown against the wavelengths at which we can observe. So if you observe in the infrared regime at wavelengths typically of one micron, two micron in the H and K band, you'll see that you are dominated by the population of grains that have an A max of one micron. On the other hand, if you observe in some millimeter or, so, or millimeter regime, so say here at one millimeter, you'll see that you are dominated by the population of dust that has a maximum grain size of about one millimeter. So you're basically observing dust sizes that are typically of the order of the wavelengths. And by looking at different wavelengths, we're not just sensitive to different dust sizes, we are also looking at different regions of the disk. If we observe in the infrared, so that's in the spectral energy distribution, if we observe in the infrared, we are sensitive to thermal emission of dust located in a region where it's very hot, where the typical black body temperature will be of 1500K. That corresponds to the emission in the near infrared. If on the other hand, you observe in the sub millimeter regime, then you're sensitive to regions that are cold of a few tens of Kelvin. And that means that you're looking at cold regions within the disk in the mid, close to the mid plane. So by looking at the disk at different wavelengths, you are not only looking at different sizes, but also different regions of the disk. And that allows you to indirectly probe the dynamics of those grains by looking at how they are distributed in different regions of the disk. To go back to the opacities, we saw that they vary with wavelengths and said it differently, they vary with the frequency of the observations. And we can use that as a tool. If we observe a disk at different wavelengths and we can measure the variation of the flux of this disk, then we can reconstruct the maximum grain size of the dust population. If you are in the optically thin regime, then the flux is proportional to the total mass, the dust mass of the disk times the Planck function at the temperature of your disk times the opacity of your grains. And the opacity is a power law of the frequency with an index beta that is directly related to the maximum dust size. In the millimeter regime, we can use the Rayleigh-Jeans approximation and the Planck function is also a power law. So in the end, we're left with the flux of the disk that is directly proportional to the dust mass times a power law with an index alpha that we call the spectral index that is two plus beta that is related directly to the maximum dust size. If beta is smaller than one or alpha smaller than three, that means that we have large grains there. And indeed here, you can see the prediction um, of the beta index with the maximum grain size of the dust population for different dust population, different dust size distribution, and also different porosity for the dust. And you can see that when beta is lower than one, the grains present in the disk are larger than a few millimeter. So by measuring the spectral slope of your emission, so the flux of the disk at different wavelengths, you can actually constrain the maximum grain size. But you must keep in mind also that a low spectral index could result from the fact that you have high optical depth regions, in which case the flux of the disk is actually proportional to the disk area. So we can use that and observe disks at different wavelengths to try to reconstruct the spectral index of the emissions. 
And this has been done in Star Forming region by looking at all the disks um, with intermediate angular resolution in order to gather the entire flux with ALMA. And this is the lupus star forming region observed in Ansdell et al. at different wavelengths, 0 0.8 and 1.3, and more recently at 3 mm in Tatsari et al. And from these maps, you can reconstruct a spectral index for all of these disks in different star forming regions. And that's what is showed here. This plot shows the spectral index between 1 and 3 mm against the flux of each disk at 1 mm. And you can see that this has been done for three star forming regions, Taurus, Ophiuchus, Lupus, and that for all of these disks, the spectral index is lower than three. And that indicates that there is grain growth happening in this disk, that we have grains that are larger than a few millimeters. And this cannot be only due to the fact that some regions are optically thick, because in order to reproduce both the spectral index and the flux, even the optically thin regions need to have grain growth. And when you convert the spectral index into the beta index, then you find that for the disk located in the lupus star forming region, the spectral index indicates that we have indeed grains that are larger than a few millimeters. And this plot shows the radial extent at three different wavelengths from 0 0.3 to 3 millimeter. And this shows that for this disk, the radial extent is almost the same at the three different wavelengths. And this is inconsistent with the prediction of radial drift. If this millimeter pebbles would have drifted towards the center, towards the star, we would have seen, we would have measured a radius that is decreasing with higher, longer wavelengths. So this results, both the spectral index and the measurements of sizes tell us that we must keep these grains, these large grains, in the disks, in the outer disk regions. And to do that, to prevent this pebble from drifting inward, we need the presence of dust traps. And recent higher angular res resolution observation of this show showed us that almost all the disks have substructures. And these substructures are due to variation in the pressure all over the disk extent. And these substructures that we see in this could be tracing dust trapping. And this study has been done on uh, some rings of the D-sharp survey. And in this plot, here I've shown the optical depths of rings, so different rings selected in different targets, the width of the rings, and the mass, the total mass dust in each of these rings. And if you focus on this panel here, you can see that the measured widths of the rings are always higher than the angular resolution that limits how much we can resolve um, the rings, but are also smaller than the pressure scale height. And this is a strong constraint, strong indication that there is dust trapping occurring. Another interesting thing is that this can happen in some of the rings and not all of the rings in target. For example, if you take at this disc here, the first ring here, ring one, does not seem to be a dust trap, while the second ring, ring two, is consistent with being a dust trap. And the fact that uh, there is an optical depth that is almost constant could be an indication of planetismal formation. In this plot, you see the optical depth that is predicted by dust evolution models with time for this second ring here. If you do not include planetismal formation, you can see that the optical depth will in keep increasing because you grow more dust grains um, of millimeter size, and at some point you become more and more and more optically thick. But if you start forming planetesimals, so larger bodies that are actually optically thin at millimeter wavelengths that we cannot see at millimeter wavelengths, then you decrease your optical depth towards something that is similar to what we observe. Now that we know that we have dust traps, we have to prove that this dust trap allow grains to grow. And we can do exactly the same as in the previous um, slides where we were measuring the flux at different wavelengths of disks. But now we can do it in a specially resolved fashion. If you take the same disk and you observe it at different wavelengths at one and three millimeter, you can derive a specially resolved spectral index and from there derive the maximum grain size in the rings. And that's the work of Anibal Sierra 
And you can see that from these multi-wavelength observations, we can derive the dust density profile readily, where you can see that you have the inner disk and then the two rings, the inner disk and the two rings, and also the maximum grain size in these rings. And you can see here that in the first ring, it doesn't seem to have an increase in terms of the, an increase of the dust size, while the second ring clearly shows an increase in the dust size. And that means that this second ring is a dust trap, where the first ring might not be a dust trap and might be uh, only showing traffic jam, as Till was explaining, due to a local change of the physical condition in the disk. For example, a snow line. Now, do we have evidence for dust dynamics? And the answer is yes. As soon as you observe a disk at different wavelengths, you see different things. And that tells you that the small and the large grains do not behave in the same way. This is a disk around IM loopy observed in scattered light. So in scattered light imaging, we are tracing the stellar light that is scattered off the small grain in the surface layers. And here you can see clearly the ball shape of the disk, the entire 3D structure of the disk with the top surface here, the mid plane that is dark because of the optical depth and uh, the surface from the back side of the disk. But if you look at the same disk, in the, mid, in the submillimeter region, you are sensitive to the mid-plane tracer, the larger grains in the mid-plane. And you can see that not only they appear very differently, but that this one looks flat like a pancake. And we can look at the first direction readily. And we immediately see from different observations at different wavelengths that there is evidence for dust rail drift. This is TWU Hydra observed in scattered light, so probably the small grains well coupled to the gas. And this disk is almost face on. And you can see that we also detect rings and gaps. And the same disk is now observed here in the second panel in the submillimeter uh, regime in the dust thermal emission. And it appears to be much more compact. And that tells us that the millimeter grains have drifted inward compared to the small grains. And now if we observe the disk in the gas, so in the CO line, we also trace a much more extended disk. So you can observe a lot of disk in different star forming region and measure the outer disk in different tracers, in the gas and in the millimeter dust. And this plot shows the radius of the gas versus the radius of the dust for disk in the loop star forming region. The blue dashed curve shows an equal radius for this gas and for the dust, whereas the red one shows a factor of four. So the outer radius of the gas is four times the outer radius of the dust. And you can see that most of the disk show indeed that they are much more extended in the gas than in the dust, and sometimes as much as a ratio of five as shown in this disk here, where you see in contours the dust emission and in color um, the gas uh, velocity. And we also see evidence of dust radial drift in substructures. This is a, an example of an observation of a disk that has a, in the submillimeter, a very clear ring and a dust depleted cavity where there is no millimeter dust inside this cavity. And this cavity could be due to planets or to a massive companion. And if you observe the same disk in scatterlight that trace small grains, you see that the small grains are distributed inward of the millimeter ring and also outward, they're just more diffused. And this can be used, this difference between the small grains and the large grains can actually be used to constrain the pressure gradient and what is causing the, the, the ring and the trap to start with. And this shows predictions from a model in which a one Jupiter mass planet is carving a cavity and leading to a pressure bump. And this trap large grains, millimeter grains into a narrow ring, while the small grains that are still well, that are well coupled to the gas can still flow inward. And this could constrain, this difference between the, the small and the large grains could constrain, for example, the mass of the planet, if this is what is creating uh, the trap. And now in the other direction, we have evidence for dust vertical settling already just by looking at high resolution observations. So these are the observations of HL tau, and you can see that we have uh, rings and gap, but that the gaps widths are very symmetric, which means that the disk already has to be 
very geometrically thin. These are predictions from models to compare to the observation. And this one does not have settling of dust included. And you can see that the gaps are much wider along the major axis than along the minor axis. And that can be explained simply by projection effect along the minor axis of a disk that is flared and has a vertical structure. And these models show that actually to reproduce the symmetry of the widths of the gaps, one needs to have extremely efficient settling. On the other hand, on this object, the spectral energy distribution requires to have small grains at very high altitude, meaning that the small grains are expanded vertically very high, while the large grains, millimeter grains, are located in a very, very geometrically thin, narrow midplane. And these predictions were made much more clear with the case of edged on disks. And you can see here in this disk that I've seen edged on that we can directly probe the midplane layer. These are in color the observation by the Hubble Space Telescope where we see scattered light. So the star, the star, the stellar light that is scattered of the small grains on the surface. So you can see the two surfaces, the two sides of the disk. And the dark lane in the middle is tracing the midplane. When you observe with ALMA, these are the contour, the dust continuum emission, you see that the millimeter dust that is traced by ALMA is extremely narrow vertically, while the small grains are distributed along a much, much broader um, vertical range. And these edge on this were also sort of different wavelengths. The issue here, compared to the previous cases of spectral index maps, is that we are limited by the fact that our emission is optically thick. In any case, all these observations show that the settling, the vertical settling is highly efficient and that constrains a very low turbulence parameter. To summarize, the observations show that dust grains can indeed grow and that they are subject to radial drift. They drift to region of higher pressure. We also find in observation that some of the pressure perturbations are indeed dust traps where grains can efficiently grow. Unfortunately, we are still limited in the sense that we cannot directly observe planetesimal in this. We only can deduce their presence. However, we cannot observe directly planetesimals in disk, and we are still limited to inferring the presence of millimeter and centimeter pebbles. And in general, the dust sizes are still very challenging to measure, and there are now uh, different ways to address this, for example, through polarization measurements. The porosity of the dust grains and, in general, the properties of the dust grains are poorly understood and they have a very strong impact on the opacities that we are using to interpret our observations. We know that grain growth can also happen at very early stages of the stellar formation and we still need to connect observations of younger objects to the ones that we have on disks. And the final point is that we're still strongly missing a global modeling of multiple dust tracers. So the same objects observed at different wavelengths and different dust tracers will show very different features. But these features must be connected to the process that are affecting the disk. And for example, here in Aborega, you see in the infrared scattered light, the small grains, a lot of spirals and a lot of substructures. If you zoom in, you will see here clearly that the small dust are still um, showing a lot of small scale structures. But at the same scale, the same object seen in the millimeter appears, in the millimeter continuum appears as a ring. So I mean, the millimeter grains are located in the ring while the small grains are showing spirals. And this is another example of a transition disk where in scattered light, we see two spirals and a cavity, but in the millimeter, we see a ring and a very strong asymmetry towards the south. And the spirals could be due to a massive companion, for example, a massive planet located outside of the disk that will trigger the two spirals. But it's unclear if this companion would be able to create the feature that we see in the millimeter. To conclude, to fully constrain the dynamical processes that are affecting the evolution of the disk, one needs to model and understand the evolution of both small and large dust grains.